All right, all right. We are joined this week once again by our friend Johnny Stitches. Learned last time it was Mr. John, not Dr. Johnny. He's only Dr. Mr. Stitches. Yeah, J- Dr. Stitch is a fictional character <laughs> from the city of Morristown. But uh, without a whole lot of uh, preliminaries, we're going to go ahead and just get into the meat of the show. This yeah. has been kind of a long time coming because he's a super fan and I am a, I'm a super fan of certain parts. Gotcha, so, gotcha. So we can, we can go in, but we're going to talk about the, uh, the epic trilogy and then trilogy and then trilogy. The, best, the best story ever told. Called uh, Star Wars. Star Wars. So we're going to start at the beginning. Um, a long, of, long time ago. Of, in of a galaxy what, far, far away. Of what was uh, basically my history of it. Like we said, I'm born in 75, so I was two years old when the first one came out. Um, I saw, my parents went and saw Empire in the theater. I was with them. Um, I remember seeing Return of the Jedi um, in 1983. I would have been seven, actually. Oh, that's a beautiful age. Um, saw it in the saw it in the theater with my cousin Aaron, who was like four four or five and he got scared out of the theater by, by all of the Muppets by all the monsters in Jabba's Palace we actually did a replay just kind he of didn't make it all the way to the cannibalistic titty bears no 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 he's, he, 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 <laughs> well no I think he came back after after Jabba's Palace fell oh okay and so we got to see the teddy bears with, yeah where's the heads that were in those storm helmets <laughs> right <laughs> but um so I have a long and storied love. One of my first memories was uh, opening a playset, the Hoth Battle playset. Um, had the spinning cannon and the uh, probe droid, mm, cool. and had uh, Han Solo. It didn't have Luke Skywalker. It had Han Solo and uh, one of the other officers, and it was a playset that came. And I had all the Star Wars guys, and kind of like uh, Elliot and E.T., I had them all over my room, all over the play awesome. sets, and all those original characters. Nobody ever thought about value. I mean, right. that was stupid. I mean, shh. you play He's with them until... You. <laughs> you know, dude, you just play with them until they got bent up, and then you'd get a new one. Get You're new like, one. Mom, Throw this one Luke, Luke's arm broke off. So, so, you and know, get a worn out R two D two for like thirty bucks. <laughs> yeah, you know all all of those little vinyl capes came right off because it felt weird on your fingers whenever you moved their arms, mm-hmm. and just weird stuff like that that I remember. So I mean, um, loved, loved, loved the the OG trilogy. Well, is is one hundred percent still holds up? Um, not it's it's canon. And in fact, I have like two or three different sets of original theatrical VHSs. Because they haven't been, they they haven't been they, tampered they with, they haven't been tampered with. That's right. So nice. um, whenever I watch Star Wars, I watch it on on VHS, and uh, you still get to see Sebastian Shaw at the end. Yeah, nice. it's good stuff. Nice. So um, that's that's kind of me, and so I, I don't want to go so far as to say I'm a purist on it, but again, whenever they did the every generation has their trilogy. Whenever they did the re-releases, I'm like, wait, what? No, that's not how that works. And then George Lucas went a little CGI crazy mm-hmm. in the in the late 90s, where he's going back and adding like... Well, he's making Phantom Menace and thinking, well, I can do this. Yeah. I could do this. Mm-hmm. I could do this. Yeah. And he comes out like, oh, well, this was always the story. I'm like, I, don't, I really yeah. don't think you needed a dude falling off of a big lizard monster in Mos Eisley. Yeah. That's not really part that's of the just story. you had the money and the means. Yeah. So I didn't really like that. It felt like somebody come in and mark we it have a We have a saying in our podcast, like, there's so many things in season one I want to go back and separate aside and fix, and it's literally all the time it's called, don't go back and George Lucas up the first season. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, but along, you know, and with that, I used to read, I mean, I had the storybooks, and there was always, this was full on before the internet. Mm-hmm. There the was, original expanded universe. There was there was rumors. Oh, I mean, I mean I, this was before the books. I mean, this oh, okay, just, okay. Just, just comic books and kids talking. Right. You always knew out there somewhere. I don't ever remember where it came from, but you always knew out there somewhere that at one point Obi Wan had kicked uh, Darth Vader's butt. Mm-hmm. Didn't know how or why, but you knew that that's why they were they were not friends anymore. Yep. Um, Darth Vader describes how. Uh, he was an apprentice, and he was mm-hmm. a friend, and all of that stuff. So you always had this kind of it was it was very kind of magical mm-hmm. and lorish in the past, and 
So whenever they released the the, the original the, the 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 prequel series, um, they took the magic and made it science. Well, what they did was they took the mystique and made it midi chlorians. They it, they took the mystique and they made it science. That's that mm-hmm. was one mm-hmm. that was a fatal flaw. No, yeah, they, they was, gave they gave the force a uh, texture. Uh, something you put underneath a microscope. Right. But before it was just something that flowed through us, binds us, puts us together. Yeah, it, like everybody was was at least vaguely sensitive to the force. It was mm. a it was a force. Something you could draw on. It, yeah, you could you you know, and even if you weren't necessarily a a sensitive, if you weren't Jedi material, at mm. least you could have premonitions or right. moments or whatever. Whereas if it's in your blood, it's just in your blood, mm-hmm. and so it's just latent talent that you have to develop, and you either got it or you don't. So right. all of us kids who just thought if we if we tried real hard to be Jedi, we could, because anybody could be a samurai. You just have to go to karate a lot, right? You know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you come and find out that you can only be a samurai if you've got this special blood type. Eh, well, okay, well, I, I get what you're saying. So that that kind of was like okay, that was a letdown. Um, also, one of the things, and you now that I'm mentioning, you probably know this, but the sound effects in the original trilogy made everything very tangible and real. Mm-hmm. These, this is a society of borrowed technology, and they don't really understand it. It's it's circuits and it's drives and it's it's uh, componentry. Yeah, and, taking uh, pennies and putting them across the fluorescent light bulbs and getting your lightsaber sound. You know that kind of stuff. But like when R two D two falls over, whenever he's shot with the uh, the stun cannon, and he's like, "Thump!" He's hollow inside. Right. You know when the when Luke's uh, ship crashes at Dagobah, and it you know it kind of boom, 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 boom. Yeah. You know it's it's solid. It's not going to just crash. It's not going to disintegrate. But it's it's heavy and it's tangible and it's it's one step up from an airplane. Right. Basically, it's maybe made of titanium and it's not. Right, disintegratable, but then you go back forty years, and everything's like aluminum alloy and shiny and and yeah and uh, I, know, yeah and I, I get this one the, a lot the, those sorts of things where it's like okay that universe didn't feel real a galaxy far far away felt very close in the original trilogy it just felt like like right. We could be there in a few generations mm-hmm. if we were if we were smart and kept on kept on track, met some other cultures and borrowed some technology, and we could be flying around. Gotcha. Um, a prequel prequel series, not so much. It just it felt over there. Right, felt like galaxy far far away. And it also short. It's they, the the writing was such that it made the universe very small because in the original trilogy. Luke was important specifically because he was related to Vader, Mm -hmm. who was important specifically because he was the right-hand man of the Emperor. But turning it all into a big family affair and having it be, like, so... Well, he kind of he kind of shot himself in the foot there because originally that was not where he was going anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a very... That was a script rewrite. I mean, all that's as well-known. Like, originally the big... Reveal was supposed to be that, you know... Obi-Wan killed his father. Right, right. exactly. Like, it's supposed to be... A complete, so, I mean, it kind of sets up that for the future. Um, and there, there are de- definitely some MacGuffins in the mm-hmm. in the OT, so I'm not, you know... Oh, we, yeah. We can compare and contrast, but these were just sorts of the things, you know, making the universe very small. Like, Darth Vader didn't create C-3PO. C-3PO was just a standard-issue protocol droid. There's hundreds or millions right. of them. You know, that kind of stuff. R2-D2 could have his importance because he was kind of the spy. He's always been a little sneaky. Right. Um, but it was just kind of those little things where it just... It felt like shoving all of these old characters or predecessors to old characters into a universe for the purpose of old school nostalgia. And selling opposed, toys. As opposed to telling a story. Yeah. Which I wanted old... I wanted young old characters... And I wanted new characters like hmm. grandpa or great grandpa and war heroes. Gotcha, gotcha. And and that kind of stuff. And so for me, it was kind of like. And then the the the, the dialogue was so horrible; <laughs> it was kind of hard to watch in parts. Hmm. It's, you know, it's like the 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 love story was just like, oh my god. Okay. Well, I I, I disagree <laughs> with a lot of that. So I'm going to go into how I got into Star Wars. So well, I, sorry, I don't want to. Okay. Fit, but okay. 
Force Awakens, mm-hmm. I thought was great. Mm-hmm. Um, that's funny, though, because Force Awakens was such that when I was first started watching it, I kind of had the same feeling about the whole, like, packed universe. You know, there's one mm-hmm. little spot. It's like, sure, she just happens to be in both. But then I looked over at my daughter, who was four, who's sitting there watching the screen with a, just eyes wide open, just like jaw yep. dropped. Exactly. And I looked at her, and I looked up at the screen, and I saw Ray wielding that blue lightsaber. And I was like, holy crap. Mm-hmm. This is not for me. That's for her. Right. And she's all in. And the prequels were for me. So. Yeah. And that's where, you know, so yep. that's that's... That's yep. where I draw the line. So, like, everybody hated The Last Jedi. I actually enjoyed The Last I Jedi. I love The Last Jedi. I've got, I've got some issues with some of the... Yeah, me too. Or we could do a whole podcast about the of, issues of, of, of Star but, Wars. But, but people as a whole that were just dogging it as some kind of, like, feminist propaganda, I'm like, I don't get it. Oh, like, yeah. Um, well, I mean, and I don't get political on anything, but, yeah. like, if you've got... If something is, like, true allegory... If it's if it's like uh, uh, the Narnia Chronicles, where those are straight up Bible stories told in a fantastic setting, exactly, and it, you know what it is when you're reading it, so right. you're, you don't feel like you're being fooled. It just is what it is. Great. I don't like it when people try to sneak allegory in, but I also don't like it when people try to extract it out, out of something, something that's something. not there. It's not like a certain scene in Endgame where it was like, all right. How they magically all get together for this for this photo shoot? Right. Why do they keep taking off their damn helmets? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, so for me, uh, background on I guess my my Star Wars credentials. I uh, um, when I was a kid, I was already exposed to Star Wars, but in a, like it's on TNT, it's on TNN, like in the background, USA is playing it on a Saturday. Um, my first real exposure to it, like like where I consciously remember, like the reveal of Luke, I'm your father, and all that. No, I'm your father, and all that kind of stuff, was from the Muppet Babies. <laughs> because as a little little kid in the late '80s and early '90s, the Muppet Babies was on like Nickelodeon and stuff mm-hmm. like that all the time, and like you know you'd only see the parents' legs and all that, and it was all about like the Muppet Babies, the the cartoon. But they were always like way before Simpsons, way before Family Guy, like. Constantly, somebody was in a TIE fighter. They were yeah. running from an uh, ATAT, something like that. So I was like, man. But and I knew my brother at one time was really, really into it because my brother's he's five and a half years older than me, and so he was as a kid like massively into to Star Wars because I mean the the three movies had just hit. They were done. Now they're on HBO. They're mm-hmm. like, but their their cultural impact is still there. And it wasn't for the dark days after the Empire. Not yet. Not where I grew up as a kid. So, apparently, my brother, like yourself, had all these toys. And then one day, my mom was like, do you want these anymore? And he's like, no. And they just got rid of them. And by the time I got up to about age, like, 9 or 10, this you know, 14, 15, 16-year-old, you know, girls, cars, mm-hmm. Star Wars is the furthest thing from his brain. And I was, uh, believe it was the, the summer of 95... If I remember correctly, uh, spring break of 95. So I was nine years old. And there was this little place in, on Alaska, Texas called Dynamite Video. Out, I don't know if on, one, on a 190, on the stretch between Livingston and Huntsville out there, just this little frame, old frame house thing. When you walk in, there's these wooden slats that have like the horror movie section that you can't go in there section. Yeah, and yeah. like uh, the, the kid section. Right yeah, exactly. So I went in there and my mom's like, pick you out a few videos because essentially, uh, TV is going to be your babysitter for spring break. You're old enough that, you know, you're well old enough that your brother doesn't need to be there with you all day, that kind of thing. So pick you out a couple of movies. I remember I got the Brave Little Toaster and I walked over and the lady, and I wish I could remember her name because without this lady, all this stuff around you, just to give you, a, there's a solo poster behind you where you're sitting right now. There's a Last Jedi uh, poster above my uh, our, our console with a actual art piece of Vader underneath it. Every, there's Star Wars everywhere is in my oh, house. Yeah. None of this would exist without this lady. She said these words to my mom. We have the Star Wars trilogy VHS of the original ones over there right now for $2 and you can keep them the whole week of spring break. So this is 95 My mom's like, well, two bucks, you know. I've never seen them. Never actually sat down and watched them. Mm-hmm. I wore those things out. Of course. I mean, I got it. So we rented those on like I think the Friday afternoon when we got out of school. 
and they were due back the next Friday. And on that next Friday, uh, they went back up the regular price, which was like two ninety nine of a VHS. And I still asked my mom, "Can we rerun them all again?" And it was done. Oh yeah, it was done. I was just like, and I as my brother came home, I'm like, "What'd you do?" The mom said, "You sold your toys." Yeah, like years ago. Why? You know, like, <laughs> this is the greatest thing ever. This is the greatest story ever. You know, like, and so I was upset um, because obviously I never got to go see it in theaters or anything as a kid because, you know, I wasn't born. Can't right, go see something there. I there. So uh, it's funny, my counter to the, the uh, special editions... Which I have my original ones that I got right here in, in 1999 right here. These are the ones from, as you can tell, it's very wore out. My special editions, the reason why these hold a, a place in my heart, regardless of... The theater. Uh, well, I got, well, I didn't get to see the first one, because my mom wasn't convinced yet. I'm like, hey, they're re-releasing them. I think they released them three months apart in the theaters, if I remember right. It was between the end of uh, 96 and into 97, they were releasing mm-hmm. them or something like that. And uh, so if I remember when Empire was going to be released in theaters again, I finally talked them into taking me. So I saw Empire on the big screen in theaters, the special edition version, and then I saw Jedi. Um, and then, like that, it was over. You know, like, like, well, I'm sorry, not before before the uh, before the special editions. Once I saw all the originals from the video store when I rented them, it was done. There's no more Star Wars. Yeah. Because the, the wire wasn't out publicly enough where a nine-year-old kid in Deep East Texas would know that any of this was coming. Nothing about Phantom Menace was out yet. It was just like, that's done. So, I read Heir to the Empire. Yes, sir. And that. I started diving into the expanded universe, you know, of Jason Solos and all that kind of stuff. Um, Galaxy of Fear novels, like the young adult ones, I got all of those. And I, I mean, I knew my Star Wars. <laughs> like, I knew my Star Wars canon. I knew my Star Wars canon levels. Like what wasn't canonical and what was and those kind of things, right? And then, uh, after I fell off um, for a little bit, and then, of course, the we went and saw Meet Joe Black in theaters. And the only reason I wanted to go see that long-ass movie is that was the only way you could see the Phantom Menace trailer. And we went and saw Meet Joe Black, I think, like three times in Lufkin. <laughs> Just to go see. <laughs> Just to go. And I think the, the last time, you know my you mom and dad were. Yeah. My mom and, well, my mom and dad like Meet Joe Black, which yeah. Meet Joe Black isn't a bad movie. It's well, really no, not. but if you've seen it but, three times, you not, can just like... Yeah, not when you're freaking 13. It's like, oh, okay, okay, and it's a long... It's not a short movie no, either. it's very long. So, uh, the set, yeah, the, the third time, we just, like, they went shopping in the mall, went there and watched it, so I literally paid for a movie ticket to watch the trailer again. <laughs> so I was ready, and it didn't disappoint. I remember uh, I had to go to summer camp, like, when my school got out that year in, in 99. Like, I only got to see it once. So I was just pining to get the hell out of it. And it was a two-week summer camp. I'm like, I don't care. I just want to go see Star Wars. I, I, I went and gotten the uh, the visual dictionary for Phantom Menace. Like, I had the, the paper version of it with mm-hmm. me where, like, the scenes, I kept going back through them, and, you know, my mind after... And it was just... It was it was the greatest thing ever. That 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 fight uh, with Darth Maul and, like... It was, that, was, that, was, it was my, that I had there, that look. There were certainly great that look scenes in there. That your daughter had. Yeah, that was when that little kid gets in the freaking pod and R two spins around in that yellow Nubian fighter and flies out. I'm just like, whoa! <laughs> and you know, I mean, in all actuality, I'm 13 at that point, so I'm not a super little kid anymore. But it's like this is just amazing. Where's this going? And then it just it never stopped. I mean, our one of our first dates. My wife's over doing production on Siren Side in the same, in the studio right now. She's got headphones on. But one of uh, <laughs> one of uh, our first dates was Attack of the Clones. And so, before we go too deep into my top ten list, I'm going to do something that a lot of people feel like they can't do, but I can do it with ease. Okay. My favorite Star Wars film of all time is Revenge of the Sith. Really? By far, is my favorite Star Wars movie, and I, I'll go into that later. My second favorite, here I'm like, whoa, is Attack of the Clones, which is most almost every top ten list or anyway, it's always the bottom one. It's mm-hmm. even below Phantom Menace for people. And the reason why I defend Attack of the Clones to the, the day I die is on my on my top ten list. We'll go into that. That's the, the scene in there that just oh anyway, and that at the end of the day, it's a it's a, a Dick Tracy noir style story of Obi Wan basically being a detective and hunting down this thing, and I love that. It's not this grandiose space opera for that moment. It's it's a freaking it's a detective story, and he ends up finding this whole colony of these clones. It's an amazing story, amazing, 
well written. <laughs> <laughs> That's like I said, I got, I got something to, to, to the other side of I think it's just not written like OG Star Wars. Right. It's different. Um, and then my, my third favorite at this point in time, I'd probably have to pass Empire's Torch to Rogue uh, One? No. Force really? Awakens. Really? Yeah. And I'll go into that in a minute. Um, so and, I've that, seen... and after after Rogue One, I mean after uh, after uh, A Force Awakens, my fourth favorite would be uh, Empire, just because it's not just because it's a classic and you got to give. No, I mean it's just a good movie. It's a very enjoyable movie. I love it. I love the cliffhanger. I love all of it. I, I just it's a good a good shot piece of piece of work. Um, after that, it would be Solo. Really. And that really blows people's minds, but I, I'll go into my, my solo thing in a minute. I just, well, I love solo. And again, like, it's one of those things where we don't sit around hating, but there's yeah. like nine movies. Yeah. And, or ten. Yeah. Ten there's, now, there's and then an eleventh coming up. Yep. And we'll be there. We'll yep. be there in that first, in that first burst. After solo, it'd have to be uh, Rogue One, and Rogue One literally, like, everybody likes to watch it now right into A New Hope. Right, just connecting those well, together. Well, I mean, that, that was that was that was so seamlessly such well a good done. Piece, uh, and then it would be Phantom Menace, and at the very, I know this is like, oh, really, my least favorite Star Wars film is. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, after Rogue One and uh, uh, after Rogue One and A New Hope, it would probably be Last Jedi, then it'd be Phantom Menace, far below Last Jedi, and then at the very very end for me is Return of the Jedi as my least favorite Star Wars. See. Film. <laughs> I have to say, Revenge of the Sith. I mean, in my opinion, what they did with Darth Vader was ruined him. Like, yeah. um, that was another thing too. Is like, as a kid, Darth Vader was he's he was as cool as, as uh, Jaws. I mean, he there was he was unstoppable, and um, the the chore- choreography, the sword fights. So again, there was a lot of weight to them. There was a lot of, of. Have you seen the redo of Scene Thirty Eight? Yes, where they did prequel style. They did a prequel style. It was it was all right. I mean, I it was, love it, man. but um, is... the the thing was, these are real people wielding real weapons against each other, and then you go into the prequels, and they're all flying around, and you know, Superman style, and they're right. like Matrix style. And it was again, you can't you can't really but practice you... to be that good. And and so the thing was with Darth Vader and Lucas even said he's like well you know everybody just liked him too much and you know he was he was a jerk and it's like yeah you know whatever like well the, the, and, and, the, and, and, but what I was gonna say is like so my my I've seen Clones and uh, Revenge of the Sith both once and almost couldn't make them th- make it through them I saw them in the theaters and was like wow can't can't deal. Mm, um, I actually good. did enjoy Phantom Menace. That, that's what's weird is because despite, you know, everybody's like, oh, that's the worst. It's really not. And Darth Maul is just, what makes it. It's just it. a slow burn. That's Darth, Darth Maul is what makes it cool. Um, whenever he appears, he's badass. And yeah. he, was, he, was, he was a good character. Um, my, my, my down the list would be still Empire is top. Number one. Um, followed cl- closely by Rogue One. Um, then I'd probably have to go to Jedi, New Hope, Force Awakens, um, Last Jedi. Phantom Menace, okay, and then uh, Last Jedi, and then the other two, because still holding into that original trilogy, there's just there's just kind of a weight, there's a grittiness, there's a there's a there's a realism. The, the issue, funny. the the and it's, I mean, the argument I think I've had a, a lot of times with people, because um, there's no there's 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 no wrong way to love Star Wars. Loving right. Star Wars is just an amazing story that's out there. But, um, and of course, a lot of the hard, hardcore prequel fans, which I've I've met, and some of them are kind of super crazy. Like they're like, if they would have just remade those three films, most of the people's issues wouldn't be there. Remade, the like re like remade A New Hope, Empire, and Return of a Jedi. And the reason is because the issues you just brought up, like the the clunkiness of the way they they fight, the way R two falls down and he's hollow, all that stuff feels alien compared to the, literally the rest of canon now, like the Clone Wars cartoons, Rebels, all of the new movies, the mm-hmm. prequels, because he couldn't do that then. It wasn't 
the technology wasn't there. It's not that he didn't want to have Luke do a spin, jump up, and come down on it. It just couldn't. He couldn't not without wires and like it would it would it would have been a different movie. It would have been like a, a it, it wouldn't have made it. But at the same so he time, took, though, the- which is what makes him a genius. He took what tools he could do and invented tools that the movie industry would use moving forward of by course. putting like glass in front of certain paints to make something look like it's drawing distance. Genius things. But when you have a lit up hallway the way it is and you have so much film and so much time, it's when you listen to the way he describes his love for the prequels and one of the whole reasons he freaking got the check and went ahead and said, you know what, you can have Star Wars. I can't tape the fandom anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they know it better than I do, apparently, so let them have it. You know, and it's it's the fact that we're so nostalgically tied to those three films that were released at a certain said time and a certain time of America and a certain time of pop culture that they're just the gold standard and they they can't be touched. But it's just like, I mean, if I had multi-millions of dollars, you think the, the doors that open in my podcast would sound the way they do? Hell no. <laughs> I would have, I'd have Neumann mics miking up the way the, the handle when someone turns it and gets that great, but I don't have money or the means to do that. Well, and the so thing, there's the things thing is, I though, can't this do. Is, this is when it comes to, 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 to story writing, movie making, and the whole, I guess, for lack of a better word, kind of capturing lightning in a bottle. You know, can you ever do it twice? And I think one of the faults that a lot of people have on Lucas is that a lot of the things that made Star Wars such a phenomenon were these flaws, were these mm-hmm. sorts of the the creative endeavors, the the inventing technology, the models, you know. Right. Like read the story about how they didn't even make models for I think Return of the Jedi. They went to the hobby shop and bought models and put them together because yeah, they, they were already pre-made and they could yeah. just snap them together and weather them how they wanted. But um, sometimes, I guess, you know, it's it's the hungry artist that writes the, the best book. Mm-hmm. And even Stephen King will be like, well, I'll go back and I'll reread, you know, The Shining or I'll reread Carrie and I'll see all kinds of flaws and I would do it so much different now. Right. But if he did, it wouldn't be no, exactly. what it was. That if you made... remade those three movies, it'd be garbage. Right. Because everybody but, would constantly like But I think, I think what happened was he got the money to make either his vision of better or to actually slick them up and that's not necessarily what people wanted because they they did like that that right the, and also you know he well i mean so again i've got, I've got this book. It's not the just... Sonian has a uh, had a traveling show about 15 years ago star wars the magic of myth and it was a companion piece to joseph campbell do you know who yeah, yeah. you're familiar with him exactly and, hero's journey the, yeah. the, right and it had Joseph Campbell discussing, you know, all of the different arch- archetypes and why all of these characters within, and this was before the uh, the prequel trilogy came out, but why all the characters inside of Star Wars were archetypical characters. And, like, you didn't have any that weren't. So every character in, in, the, in the original trilogy was a archetypical character mm-hmm. that, would, that, that yeah. any, anybody of any age would, re- would relate mm-hmm. to they would know he's the bad guy. He's the ultimate evil. This is the, right. the this is this guy. This is this guy. He's the sidekick. He's the comic relief. You know, he's the. the Here's our the seventh samurai influence. Right. Here's our, our and, samurai and, with and a light sword. That that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what kind of made it work. So then, whenever he got the money to to, to make it quote unquote better, he didn't need to. Right. And well, so <laughs> but, I mean, well, and again, you say, but when we say people, because like for me, in that. And that Return of the Jedi right there, when you see Palpatine's statue being pulled down on Coruscant, I know what Coruscant is. I just watched three movies about Coruscant in the, in the prequels. So if I'm coming into it, it, it does, mm-hmm. like, it's cool to see. I mean, there wasn't ever that in the originals, like where you get to see Palpatine's statue fall down on the capital planet. That's in all the prequel movies. Because you knew those prequels were coming at that point when he was yeah. making those. So he wanted to try to make a cohesiveness. And I appreciate that as, a, as someone growing up in the prequel era because it ties these movies that are my older brother my dad's movies to me right so well, and when i say know. people i'm talking about the toxic fandoms yeah. The, yeah because again with me personally you know i'll roll my eyes at it right but it's, at the end of the day it's a movie right, right. exactly and yeah, so it's, it's and so a, like when 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 uh when juliet was four i was taking a couch on uh, taking a couch on the nap i was taking a nap on the couch and i was asleep and she had been at her grandparents for the weekend and Tim showed her the Star Wars trilogy. 
Oh, nice. So I was asleep on the couch, and my four-year-old comes. I think Autumn was like a year old, so she was she had no idea what was going on. Oh, wow. And Julia comes and wakes me up, opens my eyes, and she's right there in my face, and she's like, Daddy, do you know about Darth Vader? And uh, <laughs> That's awesome. I kind of shook, shook myself awake, and I was like, yes. She's like, you do? I was like, yeah. She's like, do we have that movie? And I was like, yeah. And I went and I dug up the VHSs, and she's like, Ah, and so she sat there and just she sits there and just watches them. She loves them. Oh yeah, They're and great. so like, like I never had any. I mean, first of all, Lucas is a billionaire. Mm-hmm. Um, if he's having a bad day, he can buy a Maserati or something and just right. you know, he or can, some more white sneakers, whatever, whatever he wants to do, whatever he wants. Um, it's more moves. so so I mean, and, and whenever you tackle somebody's favorite thing, they're either going to love it or they're going to hate it. I mean, we just talked about Game of Thrones there's no yeah. there's no way you're gonna you know right. and with nine movies again there's gonna be some schlub in every See, but what's cool what I love so um, I don't get I'm not one of those people that gets off on on dog and things. oh yeah but what, what what's funny is when people you know people are like oh you don't like that why and you're like well because of this this and this I usually have a pretty well reasoned argument for like right. why I don't like something or I just don't talk about it right <laughs> you know the thing with Star Wars is it's a mixed bag because there's certain things that are just like just, right, you, it's like religion. You, you see, can't touch it, and then other stuff that you're just kind of like, eh. See, with, <laughs> with with me, what I guess what I, I I love all of it, man. Like even the some of the stuff that irks me in it. Like uh, I'm trying to think of something negative in Star Wars for me. <laughs> Ewoks. I'm not a big Ewok fan, but in the context of sitting there watching it, I I enjoy it. There's not a point where I've had the, the moment where you described earlier, where like, how am I going to get through this? None of it has ever gotten to me like that. I can go back and enjoy the originals. I love the prequels, and I love what they're doing with the new canon. Um, with that, before we run out of time, I want to get into my, my Star Wars moments. So right. my, my top my top 10 Star Wars moments. Uh, number 10, the Vader hallway scene from Rogue One. And if that's number 10, you can see where this list is going. That, it's only going to be That, for me, list. has got to be... Probably that's that's yeah. easy in my top five. And most people it is at this point. That's because it's that perfect perfect bridger for like all the fandom. Mm-hmm. It's just everybody wanted that scene, and it's so quick, but it's so perfect. You know, um, my number nine is uh, Kira lying to Darth Maul. And okay, and I'm going to talk about that for a minute. Why is that like okay? So that's better than the Vader hallway scene for you. How? All right, podcast fandom out there. I am a Star Wars fan through and through. I was able, luckily, between uh, between Revenge of the Sith and between A Force Awakens, I was able to uh, have two kids, um, be in a pretty successful little metal band, able to basically take like a, a break from Star Wars. But never like truly. I still watched all the Clone Wars cartoons with Reiner as they were coming on Cartoon Network and stuff. And we had uh, the first few seasons we were behind on, so we bought them on Apple and binged them off iTunes. And I remember when uh, Darth Maul came back in the cartoon, so there was this just great crying fandom. Oh, how? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and it just became this. I haven't watched this, so I just read an article on Hollywood Reporter that they brought back some character that got sliced in half in Phantom Menace in a place where people run around with robot legs. Just keep that in mind. Right. You know, and, but I've never seen any of these cartoons, and I'm automatically going to start bashing them. You know, and I, of course, was just, I'd already watched all of them up to that point. So when it happened, it was like, it's just this, this oh my God moment. And if you have not seen the Clone Wars cartoons, those six and seven seasons, or seven seasons coming this fall, woo, Netflix, <laughs> or not Netflix, Disney Plus, um, you owe it to yourself. It, it'll take the prequels to a level you never thought they could be at. <laughs> but anyway, so I bring back Maul, and Maul goes through this amazing... There's a, like a YouTube video. It's like 12 minutes long for the people that like went to see Solo, and we're like, uh, how the hell did that... What? That's Darth Maul. He died in that... The crappy one. <laughs> you know? And yeah, that's what people, you know, were. So they went to like... Went on YouTube, watched this video. Oh, okay, good. okay, all right. Well, that makes a little bit more sense. But it's like the, the the really crappy Cliff Notes versions of it. For me, one of the it's not on my top ten list, but it's 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 this moment that's on this list. How it got there. There's a scene in that Clone Wars cartoon where Savage Oppression, who Darth Maul's brother, 
is coming down and he lands on this junk planet. And it's where planets like Naboo and all these places just flush out all their garbage. And a lot of people, they used to get up in arms like how futuristic Phantom Menace looked like the fight that they were having. It's a plasma mine. What did you expect it to look like? It's like, oh. I mean, we're flying like a junk freighter like the Falcon in the first three movies. But there would have been no way he could have made a plasma mine in those movies. Mm. How would you mine? I mean, you can do a gold mine. That's easy. I mean, even in Solo, they do the spice mine. It's all gritty and everything. But a plasma mine on a planet that looks like Naboo? That's what all those things closing on Darth Maul and all them. I mean, that's a plasma mine. That's what they're in. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Well, that makes more sense now. I was just wondering what the hell this random futuristic thing underneath the city is. But if they would have went into 10 minutes of explaining that's a plasma mine, everybody would have hated that movie more than they already do. Right. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's just like it's a cool thing they're going through. That's the beauty of an expanded universe. You don't need it for the movies, but if you find it out, it makes the movies that much better. Right. So, anyway, they're... Uh, they, they flush out their garbage to this planet, and Savage lands on this planet because the maker of Darth Maul, Mother Talzin, which a cat I don't have anymore, but a cat I had, I love this character so much, we named her Talzin. Mother Talzin sends your, I'm like, basically there's a sense in the force that there's this pain coming from this place. And he lands on here, and there's complete spoilers for this part of the Clone Wars, so if you might want to skip ahead about a minute or two minutes. But, uh, if you don't want to hear this. But anyway... So he crawls down on this garbage planet, and you just see the silhouette of these spider legs. Very reminiscent of It. Like, like ABC 13 It. Like the miniseries It. Like the, the end of it. Like these spider legs come to the shadows before you actually see the actual thing. And uh, it's, it's, it's fucking Darth Maul. And one of his horns are all broken off, and he's coming off, and he just starts attacking this, this thing that's here. Which is like this black and yellow version of Darth Maul. And he's just going, he's just gibberish, going nuts. And when he finally, like, fucking gets him to, like, where he's, like, not attacking, he's just, Kenobi, Kenobi, Kenobi. And he's just gone. He, like, the Force is powerful enough he was able to get to that planet. He was carterized when he was cut. And he was able to fashion this out of, I mean, he's Darth Maul. He's not an idiot. He's a Force user. He's able mm-hmm. to fashion these ugly, big, trash spider legs. Well, he fucking puts him in the cargo hold of his ship, gets him, and he's just going crazy the whole time calling it. Brings him back home to Dathomir, which is brought up in the solo movie. Most people, come to me on Dathomir. We have much training, Kyar. You know, like all that. You know, for everybody that wasn't an expanded universe person, like, did he just say some gibberish? What was that about? <laughs> for me, I was like, oh, crap. What are they doing? And I still don't know exactly where they're going with that plot point. That's still future stuff. Mm-hmm. But anyway. Calm future the, past stuff. Yeah. Future past stuff, exactly. <laughs> so they get him to the planet and they calm his mind. And right when he and uh, Mother Talzin takes a bunch of droids that the Emperor had sent to attack this planet, and uh, fastens them to uh, to his new legs. And as soon as like I was in a theater like a little child, as soon as like she closes the shades in Solo, and he's walking on the beach, she's like, "Go, I'll meet you. I'll meet you. Just go." And she closes the shades and she locks that ring in, and the hologram comes up, and he hasn't spoke yet or anything. She so don't know who he is, but I saw the light coming from the hologram through that part of his shin and I automatically know like that's Darth Maul that's fucking Darth Maul and then she's just you know fucking that's awesome. dude, dude it was just one of the that took that movie from like this is a really cool space heist film with characters we know and how they got together and some nostalgia fills to you like how did those blast marks get on the Falcon now you know it took it from that cheesy status there we go there's some things I like about Star Wars <laughs> very minimal to holy crap the canon, there, just woke, Harry just Potter, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, Star Trek, nobody has a canon like Star Wars. Because <laughs> if it happens in a novel, it affects what happens in a movie. It's not a rewrite of what happens in a book. There's no other canon on the planet where if something happens on the page of a comic, it affects what happens in the movie. No one does that. True. No one comes close. But they also wiped away all of the expanded universe well, from... Exactly. So, I mean... You got somebody, Lucas, that wasn't going to do that. He just wasn't. Because there's no way for him to please. And you take a company like Disney, who is just... They don't care. They Well, they no, they have Pablo Hidalgo. They have all these people that this is their day job, is to have teams. They do care. They over-care. It's well, no, like, they don't care know, about like, wiping okay, out. Okay, so if we... Well, no, they set up, they said, all right, listen, your Clone Wars, your Rebels... Well, Rebels wasn't out yet. 
Your Clone Wars cartoons, all of your seasons, the original trilogy, and the prequel trilogy are all canon. Everything else is off. And there's a great crime fandom. I'm done with Star Wars. The Jason Solo story and all that crap with Thrawn and Heir to the Empire compared to the new Thrawn trilogy doesn't hold a candle. And I, I know that there's people going, no way you can feel that way out there in podcast land. There's people going, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> there's no way to please everybody. But from my perspective of reading the Expanded Universe novels, I just said earlier how into them I was. The way this new stuff is written just makes that stuff look like garbage. Really? The way it's tied in, the way it... I mean, these these five class... I mean, these five-star writers they have doing this stuff, because they're Disney. They can afford it. They can vet it. They can go through the book, all right? You know, oh, you're going to do this with the end. That's fine. I don't care what happens after Return of the Jedi. Just, just do whatever you want. I know what I want from Vader in the beginning, and you can just have the expanded universe. I mean, that was Lucas's approach to it in the 90s and yeah. the late 80s. Just write books about the future. I don't care. Yeah, as long as... I mean, Timothy have- Zahn will tell you that. Yeah, you know, it's free reign. Well, the the, the first uh, the first Star Wars book, which was between Star Wars and Empire, was um, a Splinter of the Mind's Eye. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> who's it? Who's the writer? Alan Dean Foster. He wrote it from script notes because Star Wars hadn't come out yet. Right. A New Hope had not come out yet. He had basically character sketches and spaceship dis- descriptions. Oh, make a book. And he, he wrote a book. Right. And it was the first of the expanded universe, and they just kept it until it got wiped out later. But uh, And that's the other thing people bring up with the Disney thing. Like, oh, they whitewashed all this, just threw it all out and made it their perfect little world. But how many times did George, like, okay, well, this is no longer canon now, but this is now. Like, this ticky-tack thing you used to have to... There, my, I used to tell you I knew all the canon levels like I knew a blue canon means that it's, it's not canon anymore purple canon is like there was a whole you know if you have that kind of thing why are you trying to tie all this together because mm-hmm. apparently it's not possible but it was and it is and it exists and if you're into that Star Wars the next movie any of the movies even The Last Jedi is like a freaking parade of just like Easter a eggs. dopamine high just like, oh, the Easter eggs all the way through that well. so anyway um um, number eight, uh, Luke facing down Kylo and freaking Last Jedi man, that was just that a, was awesome. dusting off his shoulder, and it was such a great scene, man. You know, and then him using freaking Han Solo's "See you around, kid." I mean, just pulling that line on mm-hmm. on, on the angry little kid. I mean, or the angry adult. Uh, I just love that scene. That's definitely a good hard number eight. Number seven, the duel of fates. Freaking the end of Phantom Menace. That was a you good, know from that the moment that door scene. slides open. Not even that, just the you know, at last we'll have revenge. You know, like his one dialogue line in that show. It's just su- such a good setup. I mean, um, Liam Nielsen just did such a good do- job of Qui Gon. Uh, a book just came out this summer. If you if you want a good Star Wars read, it's uh, called uh, Master and Apprentice, and it's the first novel in the new canon. Before Phantom Menace, and it is so good. Okay, it's so fucking good. Like <laughs> the, the voice actor they got doing, like or the voice actor of a narrator that they have doing the book, he does such a good like Irish accent for Qui Gon, but he does such a good Obi Wan. You know, it's just oh, it's such a good novel. Um, and the number six, no, I am your father, not Luke. I am your father. Yeah, but the, no, comma, I am your father. You know, I, I mean, of course that's gonna be on my list. Uh, it's just, it, will, it just what? <laughs> no, you know. And I I'd heard in Muppet Babies, Luke, I am your father, but I didn't ever like the context. And right. So I sat down in front of it. I just couldn't believe. Another good read is a uh, How Star Wars Conquered the Universe. That's not a, that's a not a Star Wars book, but it's a book about about Star Wars. About Star Wars. It's a uh, the audio book's really good, and the dude like went out in the world and tried to find this. They're about to screen uh, a New Hope for the first time in Navajo. And the opening, like the not the in the uh, the prologue into the first the intro of the book, talks about him sitting down when he the whole reason he wanted to go to this tribe that was about to see this movie because he knew that somebody out there because they have TVs and all that kind of stuff that would have not seen Star Wars and up until this point the guy who wrote the book's really cool dude like had never met anybody in his life even if you don't like Star Wars never watch Star Wars your life has been touched by it somehow or you know yeah Vader is the you know you know yeah. you've never seen it he wanted to find someone that hasn't. And he had interviewed this dude extensively before the premiere. It's like, never seen Star Wars. He kept asking him questions. What, couldn't answer him. Laser swords, none of it. Couldn't do, couldn't. He's like, yes. 
and then they uh, they got through the uh, to the film to the part where an X wing does this, and he goes, oh, and it clicked that he walked into some guy's. I haven't read the, read the book in a while because I don't want to ruin it verbatim. But basically, the 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 guy I remember like sitting down talking with someone before, and on the TV he saw he couldn't describe it like these metal birds that formed into an X. So he had seen like a piece of Star Wars. He had actually been touched by Star Wars. Wow! So he was the whole. Book, he's not able to find someone. I mean, that doesn't know that, that doesn't know what Star Wars is. And uh, because I was making the joke uh, a few years ago or last year, whenever it was when that that tribe out there killed that that guy. Yeah, I was like, I bet you they haven't seen Star Wars. Probably not. <laughs> so I was like, I guess I want you to text the author. <laughs> like, why don't you go try your luck there? <laughs> You know, you like to get out there and be like, no, look, we found out the sand. Some Han Solo toy washed up like 15 years ago. <laughs> um, my number five would be, I want to come with you to Alderaan. There is nothing here for me now. I want to learn the ways of the Force and become a Jedi like my father. That's just... <sighs> That's the start of the hero's journey. I mean, that is a that moment. Oh, it's just so good. Like the wind, the way the hair was just such good cinematography. Good dialogue. Got goosebump moment. The, of the swell of binary suns coming up in the background. That that music track is just oh. Um, <coughs> all right. Speaking of that, number four, Ray pulls the saber from the snow to binary suns. Same music track. Just the, mm-hmm. when that when that happened, we went. Where did we drove to? I think it was there was a, there was an IMAX theater. I wanted to see an IMAX. Force Awakens. My first my first time seeing it. And I, uh, called in, I didn't call in. I took a vacation day from work. Kids were in school. And me, her, and my friend Mervin, part of our podcast, we went and saw it. And when that thing comes flying across the screen, I, I know like all the haters are like, I thought Luke was going to catch it. But he doesn't because the story's not about Luke. And when it when it hits her hand and she activates it, and just that sheer nervousness that Daisy Ridley does in her arms where she's trying to sure herself up, and the music's playing, and the sheer shock. And freaking Adam Driver's face. It's just that right there, something 30 years from now, people are like that is a Star Wars moment. The, and it is. The Force Awakens was full of those. It's just so it good. Was, it was. That but, was an awesome movie. But just him. I mean, because I mean, we've seen Luke reaching for it in the snow when he's up in Empire in the cavern and he grabs it. So it's like taking that moment, the moment I want to be a Jedi, and like taking those two instances and just melding them together in this whole new way. And I love it. I mean, it's still, every time I see it, and it's just because of the way the strings come in on that, that music, mm-hmm. it's just perfect. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like tear-jerking perfect. Um, my number three is the Anakin versus Obi-Wan duel on Mustafar. That is the... That is the lightsaber fight. <laughs> I mean, it's not quick. It's not long. The dialogue exchanged between it is... Some of the most gun wrenching, you know, you know, like just he's like, you know, you, you'll turn them against me. You, all, I mean, he's just he's a man. He's, that's why I side so much with Daenerys' turn in Game <laughs> of Thrones because it, it's that it's that light switch moment. It's not it. He was all this stuff been thrown in the fire, but no one had kicked over the pyre yet. And in that moment, it had gotten kicked over, and all the guilt of everything that had led him to that moment, just like her, all the guilt of everything that had led her to that moment. I mean, she still burned down the Dosh Kaleen. It wasn't like she just killed the warriors of Adothraki, and there was probably a few innocent people that burned to death there, too. We just didn't have the camera on them, so we don't <laughs> feel as bad. But what I'm getting at is all all of this just comes to this moment, and I think in Invader's mind, he when he drops Padme, he's just like, oh, shit. And once you got the I mean, it's just like you broke your favorite toy, like that kind you know, like, yeah. you got that, I'm sitting outside waiting for the principal's mo- uh, office feeling in your chest. It's, it's just, and I just murdered all of these commanders like I was told to by my new master so I could save her. And look what I just did to her, but I can feel her, she's there, but this guy's going to take it away if I don't stop him. It's just epic, man. <laughs> it's the best Star Wars movie. It is so fucking when, when good. We get, when we get off mic... I'll tell you about this. I actually wrote a treatment for 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 a prequel trilogy to that obviously would never make it into canon or whatever, but but took a lot of that into consideration. Yeah, man, the freaking uh, the part where he's just I I Joe. I mean, everybody dogs him for his acting so bad, and I every every I watch I watch all the Star Wars movies once a year, regardless. Like that's. That's that happens, and not like we'll watch three this weekend. We'll watch three in two months. No, 
Like, it's a weak event. You like, coming home, I power through all of them. And, of course, it's getting harder now because we're throwing solo and Rogue yeah. Ones in the mix. But, and each viewing, I keep thinking one day something's going to pull Revenge of the Sith for me off of its freaking high horse. And because uh, I, every time I watch Attack of the Clones, I like it more and more. Like, how, I mean, that freaking, like, Boba pulling up freaking Jango's helmet and holding it. I mean, like, so many emotional moments that aren't in the OG trilogy. Not like that. Not with that gravity. And that, you know, because, I, I mean, we'll watch, well, sometimes we'll watch it in the machete order. Sometimes we'll watch it in release order. Sometimes we'll watch it in canonical order. You know, each year we'll watch it differently just to kind of see. And every year it's just, it, it's, uh, you are my brother, Anakin. And then when he reaches down and grabs that saber that's going to sit in his little hut until Luke goes over there and the little, his little Pueblo mud house on Tatooine and he opens up and this is your father. It just, it all connects, man. And it's <laughs> so good. It's so good. Father wanted you to have this. Um, he was screaming, he hates me. So why is uh, Attack of the Clones my favorite? Uh, my second favorite, even though it's like most people bought them, my number two. I killed them. I killed them all. They're dead. Every single one of them. And not just the men, but the women, the children too. They're animals. And I slaughtered them like animals. That, I mean, and they're playing the Imperial March on like a freaking ukulele or something. Not a ukulele, always like a lute, just like bing. Bing, bing, boom, boom, bing. It's yeah, just, there's, ah, it's yeah, there's so a, There's a lot of foreshadowing. It's this nuance is just so, and he's just, he's got tears welled up in his eyes, and she's sitting there like, oh my God, I really got feelings for this guy, but should I leave right now? But then she's like, no, he, he needs comforting, and he's not allowed to have that because they're very not like that in the Jedi. And it's so, I mean, we just watched his mom like, oh, Annie, you're so handsome, die in his arms. Which is like the worst feeling to ever think of is like being a teenager. Imagine your mother dying in your arms. Mm -hmm. And then he's got this ungodly force of power flowing through him. And he just taps into something that he's only read about in books. The Sith have been extinct for a thousand years. I mean, all the crap that I'm sure his master has told him. You know, don't give in to the dark side because it's bad. Why? Because it's bad. Fear leads to hate. Hate leads to anger. Anger leads to aggression. You know, only a Sith deals in absolutes. Do or do not. There is no try. (laughs) You're a Sith. (laughs) But what I'm getting, he's got all, none none of it's been, I have felled you, Anakin. Yes. Yes, you did. You did a great job of felling him. (laughs) It's it's so good, man. Um, And then my number one, which everybody's going to be like, what? My number one Star Wars moment out of everything is not in the movies. And I have to put this on my list. I know up until now it's been a movie list. Well, even though we talked about Darth Maul and Cura. But uh, it is Twilight of the Apprentice Part 2. That's the Season 2 finale to Star Wars Rebels. If you just want to watch that 30 or 22 minute episode and skip every bit of Clone Wars, go for it. But that is the best piece of Star Wars out there. It is the only piece of Star Wars that regardless of when I watch it, I cry. I really? mean, cry. And it is the moment where Ahsoka meets Vader. I've seen that on YouTube. And it's... I mean, but if you don't have it in the context of the Pantheon, it's right. just, oh, that's kind of cool. But when you, the gravity of them taking Matt Lantern, the actor that voiced Anakin through all of those seasons, and Ashley Eckstein, who voiced Ahsoka through all those seasons as a kid, and now she's an adult... And she's been sensing this this pain, but it can't be him. He's dead. And then it, she freaking attacks him and slashes part of his mask open. And he's just like, Ahsoka! And they layered. James Earl Jones came in to do it with Matt Lantern just for that word. And her eyes, you know. And she's like, I won't leave you. Not this time. And you have this part where she left the Jedi Order in the Clone Wars cartoons. And it's just bringing the gravity of this situation. You're just like... Shaking if you're this immersed in the Phantom at that moment. Because, I mean, and you didn't know what was going to happen. Like, I wonder what's going to happen on the finale of Rebels. It's just a cartoon. It's been kind of a slow burn up until this point. Vader's made a couple of cameo appearances. We just found out Ahsoka from the Clone Wars is in this. That's kind of cool. No one knew that was coming. <laughs> that was out of left field on like a random Monday night on freaking Disney XD. And it blew me away more than any film has ever done from this enterprise. Really? Because you got to watch the Clone Wars cartoons. And you got to watch the Rebels cartoons. 
And if you're going to watch the Clone Wars cartoons properly, watch Attack of the Clones. Finish it. Binge all your seasons. They're only 22 minutes an episode. It's like binging the seasons of The Office or something. Watch all the Clone Wars episodes and then watch Revenge of a Sith. And when all those Jedi start dying in Order 66, they're not a bunch of nameless aliens. You're going to be like, that's Plo Koon. Oh my god, that's... You're, you've, you've watched six seasons of these characters. You know them, who they are, what they are, what their feelings are, how they agree with this part, how this one thinks the Jedi might be failing. Like, all of this. And then just... Knock them out. Knock. It's so it's an emotional journey. I'm like, <laughs> no one's ever done it. No Harry Potter movies. No Game of Thrones. No one has ever done what they have. What they have, but, and it exists. It's just out there. Yeah. It's, I mean, if you just watch the movies, I mean, for the popcorn flair alone, they're good. Good stories. A lot of action. Beautiful special effects. Go home. Good. I watched a good movie. Great. Yeah, I'm excited. But about if you that. dive into the expanded universe that exists now, Legends doesn't hold a candle to it. I'm, I'm excited about the new one. The, oh, the, dude. the trailer! Her alley ooping yeah. over that tie striker, the, the goosebumps oh. on that. It's just—I mean, it's just a—it's a teaser. It's a teaser. There's there, there's nothing to it except for that's it's greatest story ever told. It's also <laughs> well, she's obviously fixed her lightsaber. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. So, so you got a little bit. Of, you got a little bit of a teaser in there, like uh, okay, because she's just holding it in pieces at the end of Last Jedi. You're like, uh, so how's she going to fuse that? So of course she just built a new hilt and put mm-hmm. it together to fashion it back to look like Anakin's saber. You know, that's made it through all the trilogies. It's super, I mean, that's super cool. But anyway, that's Star Wars. That is it, man. We'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we will close this one down. But yeah. hey, man, good, great conversation. Thanks for coming on the show again. Yeah, man, I appreciate uh, We're going to try to do this more often with the guest hosts. As uh, Scott and I are uh, trying to find a synergy where we can do either our live recordings or you know, yeah, do it online or whatever. But uh, we've got a lot of folks for the uh, the the Halloween show coming up. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna so be excited, featuring, man! Featuring on that, so um, we'll be there. So Renaissance is going to be there, and I will talk to you about some of the panel stuff right after the show cool. here. Sweet. And um, next time we will uh, be back with something else fun and scary to talk about. Same bad time, same bad channel.